Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Desk Side Talk with Mark. I believe this is the 13th installment of this little series where I just sit at my desk and talk to you about what's going on. In the background, you might be hearing a summer rainstorm that we're having in Boston right now, which is nice when you're on the inside, but it's quite annoying if I need to go outside, which I will later today. We're doing another off-week podcast just because of scheduling issues. We will resume back with our normal podcast starting next week. We'll do two in a row to make up for it. Although we've had a great response to the top 100 list. Got a lot of people listening there. People seem to really like my favorite game, so that's always a good thing. In this podcast, I'm just going to talk about some digital card games I've been playing lately. So some video games that function very similarly to a lot of board games. There's some really fun ones out there that I've been enjoying uh, over the past few months, and I'm going to highlight three of them. And then at the end of the podcast, I'm going to talk about some upcoming changes to the Patreon and some really exciting announcements in terms of new goals that are going to be added in just a couple of weeks. But let's start with talking about some of these digital games. So I try not to play board games online or digitally with a couple exceptions. I do have Twilight Struggle just because it has a pretty decent AI and I wanted to support it. And it's my, you know, one of my favorite games and it's really fun to, you know, play that against friends who I wouldn't be able to play with in person because they live somewhere else. And then of course I play Castles of Burgundy online really casually because it's calming and I enjoy the game, but I've shied away from things like tabletop simulator because I don't want to fall into the trap of just reviewing games exclusively through that because a lot of people prefer that for for obvious reasons but i feel like if i'm going to review a board game and i'm really going to try to get the full experience of it i should get the full experience of it of having it physically in front of me and playing with other people i i can easily see myself going down a path of becoming much more disenchanted with with the hobby and with board gaming if i was just playing on a, a simulator program on the internet rather than playing around a real table with with people actually there having said that there are some really cool things that games with that are that are made specifically for digital can do that you cannot do with a regular card game. So in things like uh, Hearthstone, you can much more easily modify attacks. You can do traps that auto-trigger based on conditions easier. Those are things you could do in real life, but they become a lot easier in in a digital game. On the other side of things, uh, a game like Hearthstone can't do interrupts very well because it would it would slow down the gameplay and you would have to give people a period of time to play interrupts and there'd be a lot of sitting around waiting whereas in a in a table situation with another person you can just interrupt them actually and say okay hold on a second let me play this in a digital format you can't quite do that as well so there's certain kind of interesting things that you can and cannot do well with when you have a digital card game so let's talk about three that I've been playing and enjoying the first one I streamed I believe a few months ago. I haven't played it in a little while, but I found it really interesting at the time, and that's Monster Slayers, which I've logged a good number of hours on, and I think I've beaten... I think I've beaten the game in every class. And this is kind of a roguelike deck builder, and it's pretty simple. You're just kind of playing what you have. It's got pretty simple deck building, and what keeps you coming back is that a lot of the power from your person is gained from getting these upgrades and achievements and equipment that you can unlock. And so the first time you play a game of Monster Slayers, you're definitely not going to be going all the way to the, to the end and beating the boss just because you aren't powerful enough with those passive bonuses. But as you keep playing, you get on, you unlock more of them and you get better at each class and, and unlock new cards and help you go along that way. So it doesn't do a whole lot that you couldn't do with a physical game other than tweaking a lot of card effects and changing cards, that kind of thing, Um, as well as just the quantity of passive upgrades and some RNG stuff, like certain attacks will have a range of values that that gets clumsy when you're, you know, rolling a lot of dice in a tabletop game. But I think it's an interesting take on kind of a roguelike where you're going over and over and over trying to unlock things. It was sufficiently challenging. Certain classes I thought were easier than others, um, or at least had more obvious 
combo potentials than others, but all of them were decently fun. It does get a bit annoying that you can't like go through and just beat the game the first time. You have to kind of grind it out a bit. But the enemies were pretty interesting, and the classes were interesting, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. That's Monster Slayers. Uh, I played a good amount, and I'm kind of done with it by now, but maybe I'll revisit it at some point. The next game that I got recently that I've been really enjoying is Slay the Spire, which is a game in early access that I found out yesterday is created by a huge Netrunner fan, the guy who actually founded and maintained Stimhack, which is the biggest community Netrunner website. And... This one, I think, is kind of a strict improvement on Monster Slayers in terms of being interesting and challenging and making you think in in deeper ways than in Monster Slayers. Monster Slayers was really casual. You kind of just click on your cards and play them out, and there weren't a whole lot of crazy tough decisions. It was more along the lines of trying to deck build and get the, the, the equipment you needed to succeed. In Slay the Spire, there's a lot more of an element of puzzle solving as you take your individual turn. So right now there are three classes. I wish there were more. It'd be fun to try them out, but I'm, honestly, the game's incredibly difficult for me. I've gone through maybe 30 attempts at trying to beat the game, which is going through like three dungeon levels, I guess, uh, with three bosses, and I've done it once. There's kind of a warrior class. There's this assassin class, I think, and then this orb class, which I've been having a lot of fun with. The warrior one is pretty straightforward. It has a passive heal, which is important because healing is incredibly difficult in Slay the Spire, but the warrior heals after every turn, which allows it to have in-class cards that will combo based on only having attacks in your hand, not just not attacks and defense. So you can potentially get through enemies a lot quicker, but take a little bit of damage along the way, but hopefully the heal the passive heal that you you start with from the beginning will balance that out. The assassin class has a lot of poison cards in its class, and it seems to deal a lot more with getting lots of small attacks. So you have card draw inherent in the class, and you have a good number of zero cost cards. One of the things with Slay the Spider is that you have a, a standard three mana or three power to play the cards and the cost of each card is between zero and three mostly there's there's one card i've seen that's five cost and it's 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 very powerful but very difficult to pull off so you're not normally going to be able to play more than about three cards at the beginning but there are ways that are difficult and hard to get to where you can either get more energy or upgrade cards so that they cost less so the assassin guy can potentially get a lot of zero cost attack cards or poison cards and things that trigger off of poison. I found that one to be very challenging because when you have a poison heavy deck, you feel like you need a lot of defense also because you want to apply a lot of poison to enemies and then defend yourself against their attacks and kind of wait for the poison to eventually kill them. But the more defense you have in the deck, the more diluted your poison draw is. So that's been a tricky one. The third character, which they added fairly recently, I believe, that I've been having a lot of fun with is this orb guy, who starts with these three orb slots above his head and one lightning orb, and you can play a lot of cards that generate more orbs, and they'll have passive effects like one mana or giving you two block or three attack at the end of your turn. But the cool thing is that if all of your orb slots are full and you summon a new orb, then the orb in the front of the line, basically, will explode and cause a bigger attack. So the lightning orb will have do three every turn if it's sitting there passively, but if it bursts, then it will do an immediate eight damage. So you can do these builds where you're just cycling through the orbs over and over, trying to get as many of these bursts as possible. There's a lot more depth in terms of trying to play your cards in the right order and effectively to maximize the output of these orbs and, you know, get enough block and enough attack and try to kill off the right enemies. Because when they do attack, they attack randomly. So you have to kind of manage that as well. I think playing with this class is super interesting, and of the three games I'm talking about here, that provides the most depth and I think interesting decision-making space in the course of playing out your turn. 
So I highly recommend Slay the Spire. It's an early access. It might be on sale in the same summer sale right now. I'm not sure I should have checked for these three games, but I imagine at least one of them's got to be on sale. You know, it's the summer sale. There's, like every game on Earth is going to be on sale. So I'm really interested to see what kind of cl- more classes come out of this one. And it's keeping me engaged because I'm having a very difficult time beating the game, like getting through all three levels. It is very difficult. Healing is very rare. And there aren't a ton of opportunities to upgrade your cards or get better cards or thin out your deck, which is super important. I think of these three games, I might like this one the best right now. But the next one I'm going to talk about, I think, is the most interesting from a design standpoint. And that game is Age of Rivals, which is essentially seven a two-player seven wonders if you had all the cool stuff that you can get with a digital game. So the interesting thing about Age of Rivals is that it's a drafting game, not necessarily a deck building game, although the cards that you draft come back around to be part of the draft in kind of a later stage of the game. So it's again played in three tiers against an AI opponent. I think you can play against friends. I'm not sure. I've only played AI. And... As you're drafting, you're trying to collect culture points like in any civilization game, but the way they do combat and defense is really, really cool in that you have combat and defense points, but there's a lot of cards that kind of combo off of each other, and there's a lot of cards that will do certain things when they are destroyed, and it's not just you're building up amount of defense and you're taking away from someone's hit points, you're actually destroying other cards. So... Effectively, you'll take all of the attacks that your opponent has, and as the defender, you will apply those attacks to your cards. So, for instance, if you have a card that has two defense and your opponent has a three value attack, you could apply that and kind of neutralize that attack by having it absorbed by the two defense one. However, if the defense value is half or less of the attack value, it will effectively absorb one, it will absorb one half of the attack. So, if you had a four attack coming at you with that two defense card you could absorb the two but then it would just create another two attack so you have to really balance and play off of how the draft is going with kind of figuring out how you can defend against attacks or how you can utilize attacks to kind of neutralize the opponent and it's this really cool kind of tense back and forth gameplay experience where you're trying to get resources and you're trying to get points at the same time you can't fall too far behind in the military race or else they'll just wipe out your entire board and you won't get anything. And it's super interesting. It's almost like through the ages in miniature or seven wonders in miniature, but it does all this cool stuff with permanently altering card values when they get hit and things triggering off of other things. And then all the cards that you draft go into this kind of final draft in the third round and you draft from the cards that you already had. So you want to build up good cards that synergize with each other because you're going to be drafting them a second time in that third act. I think it's super cool. I played it for quite a while, a few months ago, and the only reason I stopped is because I kind of exhausted all the new cards that were coming out. I think it's still in development, so I might go check back in on it soon to see if there's any kind of new content that they're working on in terms of additional cards or additional synergies or new concepts, because I think they've done something really neat with this kind of civilization drafting mechanism that you could not do with a tabletop game, and they've utilized that for all it's worth. So I highly recommend Age of Rivals. I recommend all these games. I think Monster Slayers is probably the most addictive, but probably the least interesting. I think if you're going to, if you want to look at interesting interesting, cool card things that you can only do digitally, then I think you want to look at Slay the Spire and you want to look at Age of Rivals. I think Slay the Spire is the most potential, but it's still in early access right now. Age of Rivals is a bit more fleshed out, but the whole of it is, it's it's not as expansive as I, I think the other two. So they all have their pros and cons, but I think they're all interesting and from someone who is looking into getting into design and trying to figure out game design more and write about it, obviously, I think you can't ignore card games and board game-like games in the digital space. So those are three that I would recommend. And then finally, the announcement I was going to talk about with regards to Patreon in a couple weeks, I will be launching a kind of revamping update of the Patreon campaign, a couple different changes in the rewards that we'll be giving out, and then a couple new goals. The most significant one is that if we get up to $100 a month, which we're fairly close to right now, I will start doing quarterly game giveaways. 
to the people who are supporting the Thoughtful Gamer on Patreon. And these giveaways are not just going to be, I don't mean to diminish other people who do giveaways, but a lot of them seem to be, okay, some Kickstarter has donated a game to try to do to try to get more publicity and they're doing a giveaway to help them with that marketing. The giveaways that I'm going to be doing are going to be games that I think are awesome from that quarter, either new games or games that I've been playing a long time that I think are awesome. I'll give people a, a choice from a selection so they don't get stuck with the game they already own, but I want them to be games that are kind of thoughtful gamer approved that we'll be doing on these giveaways. So I really hope to get to a hundred dollars a month and that will trigger those quarterly giveaways. So if you want to be a part of that and get all kinds of other cool rewards, go to the thoughtfulgamer.com slash Patreon. I'll be talking about it more in the upcoming weeks. And I, if I get to a hundred bucks before August, we'll be doing the first giveaway in the beginning of August. There'll be more information to come. Keep listening to the podcast. Check out the Patreon page again, patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. And please consider helping us out. Thanks for listening, everybody. Again, we'll be back with two main podcasts in a row next time to make up for the missing one here. Don't forget to rate and review. Check out thoughtfulgamer.com. Check me out on social media, and we will talk to you again soon. Goodbye.